So welcome to Tag Me In That, online programming through and beyond COVID-19. Um, we're going to be introducing ourselves in a short second, but before we get started, I just want to thank everyone for being here, um, and particularly uh, NASPA Region 1 for putting together these Region 1 lunchtime uh, presentations. So essentially every Thursday at 12, Region 1's bringing together people throughout the region to visit various topics, and uh, today we're going to talk about all things digital student programming online as we are across various places in the nation due to COVID-19 and what we think that's probably going to look like as we move through it. Um, basically, we're here every Thursday at noon for a new thing. So if you want to see what the upcoming presentations or topics are going to be, uh, make sure you check out the Region 1 Facebook page. Um, without further ado, we're going to get started. So uh, my name is Liam Rice. I am the Assistant Director of Student Conduct at Emanuel College in Boston. Um, I am the Region 1 uh, Technology Knowledge Community Representative, so I've got the wonderful duty of helping field any questions about technology in higher ed to all the really knowledgeable people we have throughout the region and in the, um, in the country, basically. Um, and I'm also the editor-in-chief for NASPA's new Journal of Technology in Higher Education, which is very exciting. We've got uh, the first edition of this journal coming out hopefully soon. Um, and it's going to be featuring a whole bunch of really great research on all the stuff that we do in higher ed and how technology really impacts that. So keep an eye out for it. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Esteen. I'm the Assistant Director for First Year Experience at Emanuel College. Kelly, I think you're muted. <laughs> that happens every time. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Connors, Associate Director of Student Center and Campus Activities at Emanuel. And so today we are going to talk a whole, about, a whole bunch about um, social media and digital programming, and Diana's going to explain it to us. Um, so, all right. So if you feel like you didn't have like a great understanding of how college students are using the digital world and how to interact with them, we hope that this presentation helps with interpreting what that looks like for you. So some learning objectives that we have for today are um, defining social media and understanding how ever evolving history of its usage, um, exploring network publics and understanding how students, staff and faculty operate in them, explain two or three concepts online with online communities development, including privacy and autonomy and propose how student affair professionals can navigate network publics and foster int intentional student development online. So our real hope for everybody here today is for everyone to leave with a pretty good basic understanding of what um, social media and digital communities look like and hopefully some really good takeaway stuff for uh, your campuses and your communities. So we're going to start off real basic just to make sure we're all on the same footing um, and talk about what social media is, right? What is the actual internet? Um, and really one of my favorite things about social media is that it is so it's so based in colleges. Um, so Dr. Licklitter and these uh, TX02 computers back in the 60s are really the first, um, first basic inklings of what the internet would be. Um, and that really came from colleges and universities. So these four colleges that you can see on the screen, uh, University of California, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, University of Utah and Stanford are actually the the creation of the internet. So computers at these four universities were the first time that a, a message on the internet was ever sent. It was two letters. They sent the message LO, which to them meant login, um, and it crashed all the computers. But that was the first time a message was ever sent over the internet. So when we talk about like digital programming for college students, I think it's really great for us to remember that the internet started at colleges. It, it's something that is really innate to us um, and that we have a long history with. Um, the really first understanding of social media sites started in 97 with sixdegrees.com, um, which was really, as we'll talk a little bit later, what social networking sites and social media are considered is sites that you can connect with other people, right? And this was really one of the first websites that you could set up a profile around that sort of stuff. Social media really came into its own understanding um, during this period with MySpace and Friendster um, and chat rooms where people really started to interact with each other in a kind of formalized social media way. Um, it's impossible to escape Facebook nowadays, uh, even if you are not using Facebook and you're using like Instagram, 
Facebook owns Instagram. Um, and so really 2009 is what uh, technology researchers consider this new age of social media, where Facebook has finally overtaken MySpace and users. And we really start to get into what we think about as social media now in our contemporary day. Um, and the question, I mean, with everything, right, is where we're going to go from here. Um, so hopefully, as we go through this presentation, we'll kind of talk about where social media seems to be heading and what that means for college students. Um, so yeah, very short history of the internet. <laughs> So throughout this presentation, we're going to be talking about social media. We felt it was important for us to define, when we say social media, what are we talking about? So um, the definition that we use, uh, social media, the sites and services that emerged during the early 2000s, including social networking, video sharing, blogging, microblogging, um, basically any tool on the internet that you can go online, create content, and push it out to people. Um, and it's, it's uh, that's really what we're talking about right now is, is how students are going online, how they're creating content and identity and how they're sharing that out with their peers. Um, and then the second definition that we use is um, the idea of social network sites, uh, personal blogs and geographically bounded discussion forums. So geographically bounded discussion forums, you think about that in the terms of, um, you know, these are groups that are really um, about a certain topic or related to a certain area um, and that's a social networking site. <laughs> so when we talk a little bit about, you know, social networking sites, um, you know, web-based services that allow our individuals, or in this case, students to um, construct a public or a semi-public profile within a bounded system. So a Facebook profile, an Instagram, a Finsta, as students might say, um, you know, a Snapchat account, those types of things. Um, they can articulate a list of users with whom they share a connection. So, um, you know, everybody has their followers on Twitter or um, the people that they follow on Instagram, and that's um, self-defined by the individual. Um, and then through social networking sites and these web-based services, they can also view and transverse their list of connections, um, and they can figure out connections that are made by others within the system. So, Think about, you know, oh, I follow this account because my friend follows this account and she said it's really funny. So, you know, I go online and I follow that account. Or, you know, you follow family members of your friends. You may follow your, you know, your best friend's sister has a photography business, those types of things. Um, so, you know, it's more than just the student going online, putting their picture and some info into a profile and then moving on. You know, they really are navigating through these networks and that's you know a very important thing to note is that they're not just taking in necessarily the content that they're selecting they may be taking in content that is being pushed through their network to them um, and then you know this little piece of information here at the bottom malice computers um, in a 2012 study described social networking as a collection of websites developed for communicating with others about self using media such as blogs, pictures, and videos. So our students are going online and they are really creating a persona um, using different media. And we all know that, you know, sometimes that persona can be real and valid. And sometimes, you know, they may fall into the trap of using media, pictures, and videos to portray an image that um, maybe isn't necessarily the, the truth. Um, but in most cases, these students are going online and they're creating who they want to be and who they want to connect with through social networking. And so there's this really great um, book that came out in 2014 by Dana Boyd called It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Network Teens. And it, it talks specifically about high school students where um, she went out and spoke, actually spoke with high school students about how they use social media. I know that is a wild idea sometimes is actually talking to students about what they do with their social media. Um, and this is 2014, so those students really have moved through uh, the college sphere for the most part. And so what they really identify are some important ideas about social media. And in our experience, really inform what practices we put out online. So Boyd has these four characteristics of social media. This is how you could describe stuff that you put online. It's persistent, right? So 
what everybody loves saying, right, is that if you, when you put something online, it stays there forever. And, and that's really true in some ways, right? Because everything that goes onto the internet is stored. Even um, people using Snapchat, which are disappearing pictures that you can send each other, those pictures are stored by Snapchat. So there's a persistence to what's online. Even if you delete something, it's still there in some way. Um, visibility, people can see far more than if I were to walk outside my house and say something out loud, only the people that are right there can see that. Um, where if you're talking about online, there's much more visibility to it. And in the same sense, there's a lot more spreadability to it where that's what we talk about when we say going viral, right? Where things can catch on like wildfire. Um, and that can be really um, macro stuff, like on a national level when we're talking about um, COVID-19 and what people understand about the virus and um, what are some steps that you can take to like protect yourself. That's when really great information can spread quickly to people and really bad information can spread quickly to people. Um, all the way down to the micro level on your communities, right, in your school where students can be talking about an event or another student or an office and that's really easy to spread because the transaction cost, as we'll talk a little bit later, about sharing things is so low. Um, and then finally, searchability. I right now can go on to the Emanuel College Twitter and search for any time Emanuel College has tweeted about residence life by just typing in res life. And it'll, they'll, all, they'll all pop up for me. Um, last time we presented this, I had a slide about um, all the times I tweeted about pizza by just literally searching like my Twitter account in the word pizza and everything from like 2008 popped up. It turns out I tweet a lot about pizza. Um, so these things kind of inform what you need to understand about that social media landscape, right? At a very basic operational level. There's a lot of um, conversations about whether we do digital programming or virtual programming, because as we know as educators, words matter, right? Um, and I think there, while there's no clear consensus on in the academic realm about what digital programming versus virtual programming like, looks like, I really appreciate these definitions that we've kind of come up with where all virtual programming is digital, but not all digital programming is virtual, like squares and rectangles, right? Where anything that you are putting online through an electronic exchange is digital. Are you hosting videos on your Instagram? Are you hosting Zoom office hours? This presentation, this is a digital presentation because it's happening digitally. Virtual programming and virtual events, they're far more interactive because virtual is about immersion. You feel like you are there at this event. It is not a screen I'm looking at necessarily, but something far more bigger and more participatory. Um, I think a really great example of what students have been doing is in Minecraft, which is uh, this video game where you can build various things um, out of these blocks. Students have built their entire universities and engage with each other on Minecraft as if they're hanging out in the residence hall lobby or they're going to class or hanging out on the quad. So they're doing all of these engagement opportunities virtually through a world that is completely digital but feels very real to them. Um, so when you are thinking about your programming for your office and how you're describing it, um, just think about what words you're using to describe it, right? So we've talked a little bit about what social media is and now kind of this is the this is the meaty part right what are digital communities and how do we as educators get to build and participate in digital ones the same way we do in physical communities so we'll start off as we always do with some de definitions so you know a digital community is at its basis a web of connections between people on an online platform. It, it can be on any platform, it can be between any group of people, any size group of people, um, but it's basically that you know web of connections that we talked about. The people that I follow, the people that you follow, the people that follow both of us, the people that only follow me. You know, all of those people and individual profiles or individual personas are linked together in a web. Um, and these sorts of communities, I really like this quote, you know, they can start and grow in platforms that are very structured, like a group on Facebook. Um, that's a very structured type of community where you invite people into a group or people self-select into a group based on a specific idea or a specific 
like, you know, where I'm in probably like 50 different groups on Facebook. I'm in a Facebook group for fat cat owners. Like it, it's, it's all, you know, whatever, you know, type of thing that you choose to select into. Um, or when you go on LinkedIn and you write that you work at a certain place, LinkedIn automatically puts you in a digital community of people who work at that institution, have gone to that institution, have some sort of connection to that institution. Uh, communities can build in more informal ways across hashtags. So when I post hashtag, um, I've been spending a lot of time on TikTok recently, which is a video platform. Students, you know, people can go online and create videos. Um, and a lot of the hashtags are hashtag for your page. And when people do that, that automatically ends up on your like explore TikTok page. Um, so hashtags, we all know them, we all use them. Um, you can use them, you know, we've used them in admitted student programming where we've said hashtag love EC or hashtag EC admitted student, you know, that's, that's building a digital community right there because anytime somebody clicks on that hashtag, they can see all of the people that are interacting with that. Um, and then comment sections are another way that people build community. So I go on YouTube, I look up a music video for an artist I really like. Um, and then there's a whole community of folks underneath that um, who are commenting. And those can be people that really like the person or not like the person. Um, sometimes those communities can take a you know, right turn and they start talking about something completely unrelated, but that starts a thread um, and that's you know, a community. So what's really interesting is in, even in, within digital communities, you can see breakouts of other digital communities that form. Um, so it really is very complex and it's, it's a, you know, a web in all you know, ways that you could possibly think of a web being. <laughs> so what I, what I think we really want to get across as the core to this conversation that we're having is this idea of networked publics. Um, if COVID-19 and all the stuff our universities are dealing with has really shown us anything, it's that though this online work matters, right? Whether we're talking about like professors in the classroom or digital programming in your residence hall, this stuff has real impact. And ultimately, it all centers around this idea of networked publics. Um, if you think back throughout history, there's always been gathering places, whether you're talking about um, ancient Greek philosophers who would all gather around in a school together and just talk, all the way to students hanging out in your building lobby or the student center or on the quad, just gathering and talking. Those are publics. Those are public areas that people can come together and interact with each other. And in a way, what research has really shown is that there's no massive difference between that and being online. Yes, there are differences that we'll talk about, but at its core, they're just networked publics. They are these areas of gathering that we've understood physically that are online in a networked electronic way. Um, it's rather than a physical space, it's a, an imagined community together. And when we treat those imagined communities as important as the work that we do in person, there's really awesome opportunities to engage with students, to make them feel like they belong at their institution, and to further the institution's mission of educating civilians that are model citizens, right? Um, so we'll talk a good deal about what those network publics look like um, and how students kind of envision themselves in it. In the same way that like, so Kelly loves talking about network publics as. <laughs> <laughs> I really, yeah, it's, it, as somebody who, you know, runs a student center, I very much appreciate the idea of, you know, having these spaces that are online that students are still connecting with. So when you think about the idea of a playground or a shopping mall, those are two places in which a group of sometimes, most of the time strangers come together. Um, they may be with another person, they may be by themselves, they may be with a family member, um, and they are exchanging social ideas or exchanging culture. There's intellectual conversations that are happening. Um, you know, I think about my office is on the first floor of our student center, and I think about all the conversations I overhear as students walk to the elevator to go to class, or they walk over to the cafeteria, to, you know, to get lunch or get breakfast or whatever it is. Um, sometimes those conversations are very intellectual and deep and they're talking about ideas that they're learning in the classroom and sometimes I sit there and I'm like really this is this is what you're talking about right now um, but you know that that happens in um, you know places that we physically are in um, and you know this presentation is aimed at thinking about how we can then take those networked publics and create space for them online through various platforms um, so you know when you think about students being in a digital classroom 
you know, that in a lot of ways mirrors the idea of being in a, in a classroom in and of itself. You know, they're all paying attention to one main point. They're all there, um, but it's a public space. And I think we've all also seen that the networked public online idea can be co-opted by people. We have Zoom crashers and all kinds of things that are happening that could very, real, very much happen to a student or a group of students that are interacting in a public space physically. Um, so, you know, it, it really does mirror online what we're experiencing on a daily basis. Um, the other point that we you know, want to make sure that folks understand is, um, you know, in a networked public, the transaction cost of interacting with people is a little bit lower. Um, so think about the idea of you're going to a party and you only know one other person there. Your um, kind of investment in making sure that everybody, you know, likes you and that you're, you know, you have, you make the rounds and you meet people, you know, you're maybe not going to be as invested as if you go to your best friend's birthday party and you're surrounded by a group of people that you have invested in a relationship with. Um, so a lot of times students and non-students, faculty, staff, um, feel a little bit more free um, in the way that they interact with students, especially when we're in an online platform. So, um, you know, just remembering that because you're not face to face with someone um, and they don't have the opportunity to come up to you after class and say, hey, you know, I really you know, want to talk to you about what you said about this point in the reading. Those things aren't happening because students have the ability to just dip out of the Zoom classroom, right? They don't, they don't have to stay in the space um, and that person can't necessarily follow them unless they have another connection to them. Um, so, you know, it really does provide an awesome freeing sense of exchange. People are much more open sometimes online than they would be uh, in a physical setting, but it can also kind of backfire in, in a certain way. And um, people might be more free to say what they really want to say and not feel like anybody's going to then, you know, follow them and, and call them on it. So. I think what Diana is going to talk about in a bit too, it's what, the current situation I think has really shown us is that the we're, you're, we're all about meeting students where they are, right? That is a phrase that we love in this profession. And this is where students are and not in a way that because, oh, it's, it's easier because they don't have to deal with things in the online world, but because it is easier for them to interact and grow that community, right? So when we talk about programming in a bit, we made a real effort to focus on to basically treat this program the same way we would treat in-person programming with the same importance of it. Because students, all the stuff that we think about students doing in this field, right? We talk a lot about in our offices and in our teams and in grad school and beyond about student development. We all love student development theory. Um, and there is a whole bunch of theory about online student development in the way that we talk so much um, in residence life and in new student programming about students come to college and they are learning more about themselves. They're learning this academic stuff, but they're also understanding who they are as people and really engaging with this self-identity. And students have to do that online. Everybody has to do that online when they go on. There's this process of typing yourself into being where, like Kelly said earlier, being on social media in a social networking site, you have to create a profile you are making conscious choices about who you're going to be online. Sometimes they might be unconscious because you're just saying things, but creating your profile, that takes time. What, what's my username going to be? What's my profile name going to be? What picture am I using? Because that is you saying, this is who I view myself as. And when you're like, oh, should I change my profile picture? Oh, like what should my bio be? That's what you're signaling to the world. Um, when you look at mainly this incoming class of seniors from high school, their Insta Instagram's a big thing for these incoming seniors. They've really moved away from Twitter. Um, and their, their bios have like, they're like this long on Instagram. They have like everything in there. Like, oh, soccer team captain. Oh, Isabella's best friend. Oh, blah, blah, blah. And that is really showing that you, this is what is important to me, right? In the same way where all of us that connect on Instagram or on Twitter, or on LinkedIn professionally or with our peers, we're showing each other what matters to us. Um, like when I connect with Diana or Kelly on Instagram, 
my understanding of who I am can come through by what my profile is and who I interact with, right? Like I'm, what, I'm very passionate about sports, specifically basketball, and that's what comes through on social media. I think coworkers would not even necessarily know that because that's not something that I present in person, but that's something that I've decided consciously and unconsciously is part of my identity building online. And I think we work in a, a really exciting field where we can interact with students and ask them about that. If that normally comes up in student conduct stuff when a student maybe posts something online that is really offensive or damaging and we have to talk with students about why that happened and what they were thinking. But not everything has to go that length, right? We don't have to wait till something bad happens to engage with students about their online identity. Here at Emmanuel, we talk with our RAs a lot about their digital platforming, right, and who they're going to be online. But we try to steer away from the, you're, you're a role model for the school, like be careful what you post online. It's like very reactionary thinking and trying to be more proactive with their identity building. Okay, who do you want to be online? And who are you trying to show who you are online and what community are you trying to build online? So when we think about digital campus community, you know, in a lot of ways, we have the ability to build out digital communities in the same way that we have defined communities on our campus. So, um, you know, we take the approach of if we're planning and we were planning a floor wide or a building wide program in a residence hall, we can continue to do that online. Um, and the, the digital community is really where students are interacting with each other and they're interacting in those interactions with each other, they're learning more about e their peers and also about themselves. Um, so they're realizing what are the things that I really care about? What are the things that I'm really passionate about? Um, how do other people perceive me? That's a huge one for students to, to, to see is, you know, we've all had a conversation with a student about, you know, you, you can't, when you say X, Y, and Z online, it, it comes off as this. And is that really what you intended? Um, so, you know, that's, that's a piece of it as well, is that their understanding of themselves can very much be reflected in the way that other people interact with them and, and see them. Um, and we've, we all know that social adjustment is one of the most important indicators of retention and growth for first year students. Um, and I would argue not just for first year students, I would argue that for any person coming into your campus community. Um, thinking about transfer students, I'm thinking about graduate students, um, you know, professional students, any time that someone is entering into your campus and trying to establish themselves as a member of that community, social adjustment is very important. You know, we, when you go into graduate school or professional program, especially, you know, these are people that are going to be your peers in your profession moving forward. So it is very much important that you adjust to the social network that has been built. You find people that you have commonalities with, you find friendships, um, and you also are able to interact with people that share different viewpoints from you and are different from you, come from different backgrounds and have different life experiences. Um, and that can really make the educational experience, no matter what level you're at, much more enriching. You know, it would be extraordinarily boring for all of us, especially in a continuing ed type of environment to go in and interact with the same exact type of people that we've always interacted with. Um, you know, when you go into a higher ed program, everybody has a different kind of area of speciality they want to go into. You know, Liam and Diana are in residence life. I've never been a residence life person. I don't have that bone in me. Um, but, you know, it, it's very much important that I learn from them and work with them and had people in my graduate and early professional life who had that instinct and those and the in that passion. Um, so, you know, especially when we think about the idea that our fall semesters might be in an online or virtual format, it is very much important that we figure out how to build digital communities that mirror the communities they may have found in person on our campuses so that they can find those common commonalities, make those friends, make those connections, um, and really learn about themselves. Um, one of the most important things about social media that was true before COVID happened and it and continues to be, I think, more and more true is that social media is one of the ways in which we can counteract the, the friend sickness or the homesickness that a student might be feeling. So it's, 
It's the way that they stay in touch with, if they're going to college 3,000 miles away from home, this is the main way that they're staying in touch with the daily lives of their high school friends or their family members. I mean, their parents, think about that. You know, a lot of these students, their parents are online, their aunts and uncles are online, their cousins, their younger cousins, their older cousins, their siblings, you know, and so social media does a, a fantastic job of, you know, even if you're not with somebody on a day-to-day -day basis, you still get a good glimpse into their day-to-day -day life. You know, people are posting what they had for breakfast. They're posting, oh, you know, I'm on my way to class. You see students all the time on their Insta stories. Oh, I'm on my way to psych, have an exam today, you know, hope, wish me well. And then three hours later they get on and they're like, oh, I aced the exam, so excited. You know, so it really does help students to feel like they have a direct and immediate connection to people that they may not have a physical immediate connection to. Um, and especially now with COVID-19 and, and social distancing, it is especially important that the instantaneous connection piece, um, you know, students can in three seconds FaceTime their, their roommate and be like, hey, I, you know, I really miss, you know, I was listening to a song today and it reminded me of that time that we stayed up all night eating popcorn. You know, it's, it's, it's really, you know, a wonderful tool to, when a student is feeling lonely or sad or isolated, they have all of these tools at their disposal to, to reach out and feel connected again. Um, and I think what we're going to see moving into summer and fall is, you know, how do we make sure that we are using that to our advantage? How do we make sure that we are um, keeping teams connected? So I'm thinking about athletic teams, especially. Those are a huge part of an, a student athlete's life is their teammates. Um, so how do we make sure that um, in addition to the casual connections and, and conversations they may be having, how can we provide opportunities for them to connect with those folks around an activity or around, um, you know, a program that that kind of touches to their to their heart and to what they're passionate about or what they're missing about campus. So most professionals, I think, if they are online, they've engaged with this concept. Um, context collapse is a really fascinating thing that has a whole bunch of research on it um, about people in general. There's not too much research on context collapse, um, specifically with college students and college staff and faculty. So if you are interested in this and looking to research something, this could be a great thing for you to research. Um, please hit me up if you're gonna do that. Um, but context collapse is essentially this idea of multiple audiences coming into one. Um, we kind of experience it in real life, although not that often, but when two different groups of friends end up together, right? And it's kind of a little awkward or um, people talk all the time about, oh, when I was like in like elementary school and I saw my teacher at the grocery store and I, I didn't realize that she existed outside of the school which like, of course, but not in your audience, right? Who I am in school is, is different than who I am at home. Um, and social media really exacerbates that because all of your friend groups, all of your audiences are one. They all follow the same page. Um, now students have really, I think, found interesting ways around that. Like we talked about a little bit earlier, Finstas, which are fake Instagrams that students make where mm -hmm. they only let a certain group of people follow them and it's like a whole different side of them. Um, but we really think about that as our offices, right? Whether I'm on Twitter as a staff member or on our office Instagram, when I'm trying to engage with students that are not thinking about engaging with me, right? Where students are just talking to each other, context collapse happens where, so oh, we're just talking to each other and suddenly the office of residence life is liking my tweet or is messaging me. <laughs> And it feels weird for students, especially at first, because it's not an audience they're used to. That's, that's why we're not with students all the time, right? Because they need their space to interact with each other and learn with each other. Um, but the more, as we'll see in a little bit, the more that we've engaged with students online, not as, in, not as the Office of Residence Life, but like our faces on this page, people get, oh, these are like, they're not out to get me. I think students, when they see our offices online as an office, they're like, oh, this is the office where you're trying to balance that, right? Because there are absolutely times where students are going to post things that you were like, oh, boy, that is clearly not meant for me. But what's my, 
what's my role on that, right? And your office needs to figure that out. Um, in Dana Boyd's 2014 book, It's Complicated, she talks about this um, student, this high school senior that got accepted into Harvard, and then Harvard went and checked his Facebook page and it had all this gang-related information on his page, like posts. And they rescinded his acceptance offer because of it. But he, Dr. Boyd went and talked to the student and he really was posting that stuff because that was his community at home that he needed to, like we said before, portray himself in that way so that he wouldn't be targeted. So Harvard could have talked to that student, right? And understood that, oh, this is context collapse happening. These are two different communities that are in one now. And the student is trying to balance what that looks like. Um, and that's our job too, right? When we talk a lot about, oh, employers are going to see your social media. Okay, true, anybody can. So what am I okay with as a student? And what is, am, I, am I as a staff member okay with happening in our digital community? So we talked through a whole bunch of understanding what a digital community is and how students interact in them. Um, and so Diana is going to take us through basically how we here at Emanuel have really understood what that looks like for our offices. Awesome. All right. So first we're going to talk about what is digital student engagement and it is being able to take everything that you do in person on campus and translate it in some way online, meaning um, we can still host open mic nights, um, town halls and movie nights, but we just have to, you know, flip how we're doing it because we're not physically together and on campus anymore. Um, and another thing to think about is content consumer versus content participant, um, which is basically two roles that students can play. Um, so an example of this is we had a student recently do a program on Instagram where um, she had an ongoing quarantines um, going on. And so what happened was she got on Instagram Instagram Live um, and started talking about, you know, how she'd been doing, you know, since quarantining um, and music that she'd been listening to. And so students can play a role as far as a consumer and just watch this Instagram Live and listen to the music suggestions that are being given um, and like make their own playlist or um, they can also participate because then the student also extended, hey, ask to join my live and we can have a conversation. We can check in. You can tell me what you're listening to, what you've been up to. Um, and so then that's the other role that the student can play as a participant. And so we're also looking at, it's not just about hosting programming. Um, so a simple interact, it's a simple interaction with students. It's in regards to like talking to them via messages um, and comments is like a low stake method um, to forge connections um, in social networking sites were built to support relationship maintenance and um, articulate connections. And so um, even those simple connections that we're having with students really help them feel connected still to campus, still to the community um, and make that make them feel like nothing has really changed in some way. Next, we're going to talk about network effects. Um, your network affects how you use social media. And so the norms of social media are shaped by network effects. Users hear about sites from others, learn the norms from those um, sites, those people currently on the sites, um, and challenge and reinforce these norms. Um, and so an example um, of that is when we think about LinkedIn um, and Instagram. So the student persona on LinkedIn is going to be very different from the person that you get on Instagram. And so, you know, people, they act according to what they see. They act according to how they see other people interacting. Um, and this also is the same for, you know, programming. So your, your office, depending on what services you provide to students, um, what you have to offer, you're going to get a different student per persona. We're still serving the same community on one campus, but we're going to get different versions of students based on what it is that we're offering them. Um, and it's the same thing with, you know, the version of the students that we get in a classroom versus in the residence hall. You can go to him. <laughs> All right, so next, um, we're going to talk about some specific um, social media pages on our campus. Um, so we have um, the Office of Student Activities and Multicultural Programming, um, the library's Twitter, and then the Office of Residence Life um, Instagram. And so each of them, each of the departments are different and they show how they successfully interact with students. Um, two, two things to note about these different pages is that um, they support students very differently, but students are also seeing how these social media sites support each other when it comes to um, 
promoting different programs, services, reminding students of different things. And so I think that is also a sense of community that helps students feel connected because we are connected. Um, and so, yeah, Liam, you can you, you and Kelly can talk a little bit more about those specific pages. So I think what's really awesome about these different offices is that they we understand that we're different offices and we're not offering the same thing. Um, my Kelly can obviously talk about um, the student activities page, but with the library and residence like we're two very different services and we use our platforms differently where the Emanuel College Library is is a rock star on Twitter uh, in my experience and students experience where they aren't just they aren't just tweeting out like reminders about when their hours are right They're they're seeing students um, like tweet out that they have like this really tough paper and they DM them like, hey, like here are some like resources you might be able to use, like DM us back if you want more help with that. Because that's, again, it's not a program, but they're just interacting with students. Students that are saying they crushed their essay, they're congratulating them. Um, and then they're also really leaning on student created communities. Like we said before, digital communities are already here. Whether your office is online or not, there are student communities and you, in most cases are going to be a late comer to those communities, just by the nature of students are there first. Um, so like this um, screenshot of this tweet from Manual College Library, some students put together a Discord, which is like a interactive chat room where they get together and just talk and create things with the Manual College and the library really supports them in that. It's not top-down programming. It's student-centered and based programming. Um, in the same way with Emanuel College Residence Life, where a lot of the stuff that we do on Instagram is not hosting programs necessarily. We're like commenting on students' posts, like students' posts that are appropriate, obviously. We're <laughs> fielding questions that are DM'd from students, um, especially the class of 2024 that's coming in that has no idea what's going on. Um, we're clearly a resource there for them. Um, I like to think of our Instagram a lot as when we think about our residence hall, it's a collection of students. If there were no students in the building, like currently there's no students, it's, a, it's not a residence hall. It's a building. What makes a residence hall is the students. And in the same way, that's what makes your digital community. So a lot of what we do is uplift our RAs that are hosting their own programs. We uplift them through the page. Students that want to really show off their rooms, we were uplifting them through the stories on our page. Um, we'll show you in a second our, um, we really found that video content for Residence Life here works really well with creating student communities and engaging with them. Um, but that's because that's what works for us and our students. Um, Kelly? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I really want to highlight here when you look at uh, OSAMP versus Residence Life, um, before COVID-19 happened, I would say, you know, from probably the minute Liam got onto campus, um, the EC Residence Life Instagram was super active, interactive, provided a ton of content, um, really pushed out a lot of resources and, um, you know, celebrated what was going on in the residence halls in a digital way. Um, on the student activities side of the house, we are a type of, at Emanuel at least, our office is much more used to interacting with students in a face-to-face -face way at an event or at a program. So our social media presence was much more limited to just pushing out, hey, you know, we have this program coming up. Hey, the bio club is, you know, doing a table fundraiser in the, in the Gene Yockey Center stop by. Um, so when COVID happened, you know, we really had to think about how we can take, like Diana said, the programs that we were used to doing um, in person and how we can translate those to um, an online presence. And then how can we also continue to support, engage, train, develop our student organizations? So, you know, we also really thought about what were things that were organic to our office and our brand that we could put into a digital format. So, I manage the Gene Yockey Center. It's our student center on campus. One of the main things that you'll notice about that building when you walk in is we play music. It's a big piece of what makes the JYC the JYC. Um, you know, we play different music at different times. The student staff really get to express themselves through control of the radio, which I love. Some of them make great choices. Some of them make questionable choices. And I have to have a conversation about why, you know, Baby Got Back is not appropriate in the student center at 9 a.m. But 
um, you know, we really, we created something called JYC Jams. So every Monday we create a playlist and we push it out to folks and it's based on music that we might hear in the JYC. Um, and so, you know, we try to come up with a theme and we try to come up with a, a fun, catchy kind of description of the playlist. Um, but that was something that is really important to us. Um, we try to, you know, our office spends a lot of time trying to get students to go out past the Emanuel Gates and experience the city of Boston. Well, now in a digital way, we can t push them out to explore things way beyond the city of Boston. Um, so we are doing Museum Monday. So every Monday we post a link to a virtual museum tour or, um, you know, gallery option that they can go online and do Google. The arts and culture feature on Google has been a fantastic tool for us to use. Um, but where we want students to continue to go out and explore the world and learn about other cultures and, and see, um, you know, what is beyond our gates. Um, and then in terms of student organization support, we are pushing out things that our student organizations are doing. Um, we're, we're doing our student leadership and involvement awards online, which I know that most schools are, are pushing to do. Um, and we're making sure that we're celebrating the things that matter to our students. So, um, you know, we, we push out content for major holidays, Earth Day, Ramadan. Um, you know, we, we are making sure that just as our office would be a place that we would be hosting, you know, those holiday celebrations, we would be hosting um, you know, we would be doing something for Earth Day, we would be doing tabling or some sort of program, we'd be talking about, um, you know, ways that you can be more eco friendly, um, we would be celebrating our student orgs and their achievements over the course of the year. Um, so our social media looks very different than residence life, um, but it's still organic to who we are as an office and what we would be doing on campus. Um, you know, we, our office is not about not to say that, you know, our office is not about necessarily the people. It's about, you know, the students. So that's what we focus our content on. And what's I appreciate is that it's a continuous process, right? And that I think a lot of times you expect that you're just going to go in onto your social media and you're, you've decided, yep, that we're doing this now and you're not gonna get the results necessarily, the feedback from students that you want, it takes time. Um, what we really, stumbled upon because of students were our story highlights on our res life instagram where these are all really student-based communities in the same way that we talked about before that there are subgroups to communities our halls all have really unique student communities to them so this stuff gets cycled through um like this loretto hall loretto is our first year building that i'm responsible for and students will tag us in things that are going on in their building or their room or even just like they'll post something on their instagram story tagging EC Res Life, just saying like, hey, do all like my friends in Loretto miss you? And we'll share it and put it in there. So it's an ever evolving thing, which is great for um, incoming students to see communities actually living and breathing, but also your current students, right? Um, so we, in that sense, a big thing for EC Res Life is we really committed to making video content this semester. Um, and for us, it was really that students were a part of it because that's your community, right? It's students, staff, and faculty, and we wanted to reflect that. So it's pre-recorded content that we use where students are like answering questions about a manual specific stuff. We're trying to keep them in the Fenway area. But what's really, I think, awesome is this stuff has been a catalyst for our conversations with students where when students were on campus, they would like respond to this like, oh my God, this part was so hilarious. Students would kind of come up to RAs and be like, oh, I saw you on the video. I know you're an RA in a different building and I never would have ever interacted with you, but I understand you're a human person now, another student that has their own like personality. Um, where even now that we are away separated by COVID-19, we've had students like send us screenshots of their texts with their other friends from campus that are them just talking about like, oh my God, just watch this EC Res Life video. Like this part was hilarious. Oh, I miss St. Joseph Hall. Oh yeah, we used to cook in the kitchen. So it's providing students a, an area in a, a medium to communicate through. Awesome. All right, so the next couple of slides um, are going to be one second. Um, from a social media survey completed in the fall of 2019, we received about 124 responses from our residential students. Um, so we're just going to, you know, talk about some of the top things that we noticed. Um, so here, um, one of the questions that we asked students is about um, the amount of usage that they have with certain apps and um, why they use them. Um, so here we see that 
for the most part, our students really use Instagram as their first choice and then Snapchat and then Twitter. And obviously this will, this could change depending on your department and your institution and how you interact with students. Um, an example of this is that Northeastern has a bigger population of students that use Reddit, whereas for us, it is something that is very last. Um, next, um, we also asked students um, why they use social media and the highest response was because they wanted to be able to connect and chat with their friends, um, but then also to see um, and plan events. And so um, this result could be different um, from the survey if it was sent from, a, like, like I said, a different office that's interacting with students in a very different way and provides different services. Um, here, we noticed that the top reason why students are engaging um, with our office is specifically to plan and see events and to find and explore resources. Um, once again, we're going to talk about, you know, just in different offices, this could look a little bit different. Um, and an example of that is like in our orientation office, um, the make new friends column could be a lot higher um, if the survey had come from them because students are looking really to connect when they're thinking about orientation, who they might want to room with, um, just like wanting to make new friends. Um, and overall, you know, these results kind of shape our programming and process and angle and how we respond um, to different communities within our campus. And lastly, we asked students how our content has affected them. Um, and our highest response where students felt like it made them more aware of different things going on on campus, um, but also made them feel connected. Um, and I would bet that, you know, it's still something that students feel connected to now. Um, we were talking about a little early before the presentation how a lot of people have moved to doing different things like housing selection virtually. And so I think a lot of students are gonna be looking um, to still feel connected and more aware about what's going on, but then also like that red column where they might be you know, looking to have questions answered a little bit more um, because of wanting to understand better what our process is, our new process with you know, doing selection um, virtually. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, kind of our coordination since COVID-19. I think that something that we noticed is that prior to COVID-19, we in our office um, at Emanuel in Residence Life, we felt like we had um, a really good foundation when it came to programming. And so a little bit about our campuses um, for our first year building specifically. So I oversee St. Anne's, which is another building on first year building on campus, um, where we break programming into different dimensions. And so these different dimensions are both like fun, but also educational. And some examples are, you know, diversity programming, professional programming, social awareness and that could be anything and those guidelines are really to um, encourage students to not just do a movie night but if you can do a movie night but you know have a conversation after make it a little bit more educational and so um, and then in addition to that we you know have been using social media a lot more Instagram um, specifically and so we had um, a certain network of students who would you know dedicate I think it was Tuesdays, take over Tuesdays. And so because we had that foundation and we had guidelines, there was a process and you had to sign out and you know follow these guidelines. If you're gonna take over on Tuesday, it made it a lot easier to transition into um, digital programming um, and interacting with you know our community virtually. Um, so it just it was a matter of like getting in touch with people this is what's going on. Where are you at with this process? What are we thinking? You know, I took on myself also to do some research. What are some virtual programs that have worked prior to COVID-19 and how can we, you know, tweak it a little bit to fit our community and our community of students and what they're looking for, what they might need right now. Um, and so that foundation is something that was really important in establishing um, ahead of time. But then also, um, providing students um, with educational resources on how to host programming online. Once again, we had that foundation, so it wasn't a lengthy conversation. It wasn't a lot of work to kind of talk about what we're looking for and kind of how to do it. So making sure that students were not only being told, hey, go program and interact with this community, but here's how you can do it and do it successfully. Um, and so, um, yeah, by having clear policies and expectations, we really found that, you know, students on campus here still are being able to um, program successfully. Um, and next we're going to talk about social firewalls. Um, so this is the part, I guess, of the digital, digital communities that make students feel like they can't engage. Um, so people spend, people spending more time interacting with people from similar social backgrounds. That's something that was found um, in a different study. So 
Here we have homophily, which is, twi you know, another way of thinking about that is Twitter birds of a feather flock together. So traditionally, um, we see that students on their own take it upon themselves to kind of just connect with the people that they're used to, um, whereas um, social media sometimes, um, you know, in, in different communities and different ways that you approach students, you can encourage them to just different in, interact with people differently on social media and making sure that they're getting the opportunity to meet different people um, and not just stick to what they know. Um, and no digital nav natives, um, really talking about, you know, people, there's an expectation with digital natives that, you know, if you grew up with technology, then you know that, that all there is to know about technology, how to use it. Um, and that is like far from the truth, you know, and we're seeing it a little bit more now with COVID-19 um, and how sometimes people don't even have a laptop at their house. They have no, you know, um, computer system. Some people are having, you know, issues with like Wi-Fi and being able to be connected in that way could be really challenging. Um, and so just making sure that we're not, we're not having these expectations, but being open-minded to, you know, what people could have as resources. Um, and so some other potential challenges are um, an anonymity, um, not knowing like who people are. So be, like, hosting events and then, you know, realizing that other people could have access that could, you know, step in and, you know, change the course of what maybe what you had planned. And so I know that we've had a couple of conversations about like if we're having a bigger group meeting, you know, do we want to put a code on the Zoom to make sure that we're limiting it, you know, to the people that we want to be in there, but does that stop someone else from accessing it if they're having trouble with technology? Um, next, we have civil and intention, um, which, you know, really goes back to like finding the balance of like, what do we interact with based on what we see on social media? And so, you know, if I'm on social media and I see, you know, I don't know, when a student was on campus that, you know, they are somewhere and there's alcohol. Am I running to jump and I'm addressing the situation or am I acting like I don't see it because it's something that's happening on social media and I don't really want to interact with it in that way. Um, where is that balance and finding what works? Um, and then lastly, movement among um, platforms. And so during this presentation, we've talked about different things um, like TikTok, for example, that's something that's new. Um, and so there's, I guess a challenge of like, what is sustainable, right? So somebody might see TikTok and think, um, oh, we can jump on that and really use it because the kids are using it now, but it, tomorrow it could be something totally different. And we saw that with Facebook. When Facebook first appeared, a lot of people were, you know, jumping on Facebook, creating groups, and it's something that people use now, but the, de the demographic of people who use that um, to its fullest extent is very different. And so, you know, just keeping in mind sustainability when it comes to moving on to different social platforms. And so we know, I know we're right at one. I don't want to keep anybody too long. So we have our last part here. Um, obviously, what I love about NASPA is the community that we have, right? And digital community is a big part of this, whether it's the Region 1 Facebook page or beyond. Um, as the Region 1 Technology KC rep, I really want to encourage you um, to join the technology knowledge community. Like, this is, it's pretty easy to do it. If you have a NASPA membership, you can just do it in your profile. Um, but we really are a great resource for if you want to talk through things like whether it's a specific program um, or if you are if your office has never used social media before and you've never used it and you want to run through how it actually works um, myself as the uh, region one representative Ben Bucklin as our outreach coordinator and Jackie Masloff as our um, research coordinator we all are really here to talk through what you're thinking of but also using each other right we all can follow each other's offices and see really great things. Um, the Bryant University um, CSLI Instagram is doing their leadership awards on it today. And I've been following along because it's awesome, but also seeing like, oh, this is a really cool thing that maybe we could take bits and pieces from, right? So really make sure that you connect with us and connect with each other. Um, we want to thank y'all for coming on by. Uh, we know we filled up the full time. Like we said before, if you want um, these slides or you want to chat through more, you're welcome to email me specifically for the slides or any of us if you want to chat through some stuff, but we'd really like to thank you all for coming.